I'm Nigel Baik, one of the customer success managers here at Katif Technologies and your host for AVA Today and pretty much every other day. So uh, um, today I'm joined by a couple of people. Uh, first and foremost, I'm joined by uh, Marty Deans from Autodesk. Marty, how's it going? Good, how are you? Doing well, I'm doing well. Um, so Marty's one of the technical marketing managers over at Autodesk and she's going to be able to provide the, uh, the session for us today. I'm sure she'll go into that in a little bit. Um, and before I forget, we welcome Brian. He's uh, one of the customer success managers and also used to work predominantly in Fusion, um, in the Fusion 360 space. Brian, how's it going? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, so if anyone has any questions while we go through this What's New Fusion webinar, definitely go ahead and type those in and uh, we'll go ahead and address them. If you were here last week, you probably saw a What's New in Fusion as well. I, I guarantee that's what you saw last week because I was on here. Um, and so we went over a lot of, you know, the modeling stuff and the drawing stuff, but Fusion is really um, more of a, a double-sided program, right? Where you've got all of your modeling items on one side and you've got all of your manufacturing stuff too. So it definitely has strengths on both sides and they've added a ton on both sides. So much so that we couldn't fit it all in one webinar. We're gonna do the manufacturing stuff today. Um, so stay tuned. Like I said, if you have any questions, go ahead and ask us. But uh, I think at this time, I don't have anything else to say. So Marty, um, go ahead and take it away. Great. Okay. So yeah, like uh, Nigel said, we're going to get into what's new in fusion and manufacturing. Oops. And okay. So I'm Marty. I'm on the technical marketing team for fusion. My voice might sound familiar if you've watched some fusion uh, YouTube videos before. And I'm based out of San Francisco, where I have the pleasure of usually being able to play at the Pier 9 workshop um, with a pretty fun CNC shop over there. Of course, right now we're not in the office currently, but um, that's usually a pretty, pretty fun place to play and test out different software and make cool content. So this will, um, oh, Actually, June 23rd is our June 2020 product release, which will contain a lot of the features that I'm going to go through today. So Bryce kind of had the luxury of being post an update, and now I'm doing sort of pre an update. Um, stay tuned for a blog post and video on that, which will be on like the Fusion 360 page. And then something, yeah, and the YouTube video. And something that Bryce mentioned last week is a roadmap uh, blog posts that we've been working on, the PMs, the product managers have been working on to kind of share out like what's coming, what's happening now. So Nigel should have a link for that in the chat. Um, definitely check that out. It's something they've been working really hard on and something that we on the Fusion team like to be transparent about like what our vision is, where we're working towards. So this is kind of our way of communicating to you. It's open for comments. Um, we like to hear feedback. So do check that out. And I see that link just got posted. Thanks, Nigel. So today I'm going to go through some of the new June updates. Um, largely that will include the tool library, some probing enhancements, both for setting up. So like work coordinate system stuff, but they'll also apply to inspection and then turning profile roughing, even step downs, kind of a mouthful. And there's been a bunch of really great turning updates. So I'll just quickly touch on those because um, I'm not sure how much people have heard from the past uh, several updates. And then FFF additive recently came into Fusion, which is like plastics. Um, FDM is copyrighted, so we're not allowed to call it that, but FFF fused filament fabrication. And we recently added a new infill type, but there's you know a lot more surrounding that. So I'll go through sort of high level overview of that process and then that infill type specifically. And then time allowing we'll get into what's new in the manufacturing extension just super briefly this was all in the april update i think but it was pretty big stuff it was um, rotary for the first time in fusion um, some really good collision avoidance tilting and toolpath trimming for the first time in fusion and then i'll try to leave 10 15 minutes for q a do like nigel said put stuff in the chat um, I hope he knows he can interrupt me at any time <laughs> to ask questions. So I'll try to take those as it makes sense. Ooh, and with that, we're gonna hop into, actually not into Fusion, but into Google Chrome. So this is our online posts library, which is cam.autodesk.com slash posts. Um, I have it memorized, but there's also some links to it in the product. And specifically, I wanna look at the online tool library, which is up in this kind of like, 
upper right hand corner options, there's a tools option. And Nigel should also have a link to this directly to this page um, to make that a little easier for you. But here we have a bunch of tool libraries that you can download directly. So we launched the Harvey and Helical tools. Oh, over a year ago, I would say they, they came into the um, into the library here and recently we've launched it's all the way at the bottom. <laughs> very suspenseful the Haas tooling library so you can click the Ford fusion 360 button. It will take you to kind of a download and you'll download this JSON file. I already have it downloaded. So I'm going to hit cancel and then in fusion 360 you can open up your tool library and import that library either into your cloud libraries or into your local library. And it will dump all of those Haas tools in there. And you do have to pick it from wherever you download it to. So I keep mine in a tool libraries folder. I'll grab it. And what's really great about these libraries is not only are they, you know, exactly what you would buy from like the Haas tooling vendor, they come with a product link. And right now this is just dumb text, but in the actual update, we will create this to be like an, an outgoing link. So when you click on that link, it will go out to the product page where you could buy that tool. So if you want to, you know, program your part with various host tools and then actually go buy them or replace them if they break, this is a really easy way to do that. And then something that's new to the, this tool library and specific to um, not only the host tools, but I think multiple of the online tool libraries is they have cutting data like already in here. So this is new to the new tool library, the option to like set various cutting parameters and then choose them as you're programming with that tool. So if I scroll through this list a little bit, we have a bunch of non ferrous slot milling. Let's see if we can find a longer one. And here we go. We have some steel, some stainless alloys, hard material slot milling. So these are all different kind of like, feeds and speeds recipes, so to speak, where depending on which one I choose, it will have different spindle speed, um, cutting feed rate, things like that for that material and that cutting type. So this is, you know, of course a baseline, but it is from like the Haas data from like big PDFs that they sent us of all this cutting data. So it's a really good place to start um, when you start programming with these tools. So Haas tooling, very exciting that got posted or like launched, I think earlier this week. So that's brand new. Um, going back, the tool library itself is also new. So this should look pretty different if you are used to kind of the Fusion tool library. This is very much like a refreshed view. Um, and it does have, like I said, some newer functionality. So kind of the basics, if you want to like customize these, um, columns that you see before it was sort of a secret handshake where you could right click and you could select things and drag them around. Now we have a settings option here so you can decide which uh, columns you want and then you can actually just grab them and reorder them here. So a little more user friendly, um, a little easier to figure out <laughs> if you don't know secret handshakes like right clicking. And then um, probably the most exciting thing, well, I think probably the most exciting thing is this ability to set like various feeds and speeds. So if I go to one that maybe doesn't have any like this, I have a default preset, which is just like the default values for those tools. Maybe if you have old fusion libraries, they'll mostly say default preset. I can go in and edit this, add a new one, um, maybe set whatever values I want it to be and then name that. Uh, an appropriate name, accept, and then later on, and I'll, I'll show an example of this, when I go to use that tool in like a, an actual tool path, I can choose from a drop down of these presets, which is pretty great. The other thing that I really like that was a pain point before for, at least for me, was setting a tool holder could be pretty painful. So now if I go to my holders library, and grab one. I'm not gonna think super hard about it, so don't make fun of me if it's uh, weird. If I grab copy the tool, and in this case it's a holder, and go grab a bunch of tools that don't have a holder, 
select them all, I can right click and say apply to holder to tools. And then it, if there's already a holder applied, I think it asks me like, are you sure that you want to do that and replace the holder that was on these tools before? In the case where they didn't have a holder on, it just applied it. But now um, I know for me in the past, that was a big pain point of like having to go and do that for every individual tool. So way easier if you're setting up a library for the first time, if you're buying new holders, anything like that. Um, yeah, and I think that's most of what's new in the tool library. If you want to play with this today, and I will talk a little bit more about things that are in preview later on, but you can go to your preferences, go to preview features at the very bottom of the list. And then in here, you can enable various previews for various parts of the product. Um, that one specifically is in tool library. And this will be fully released in the June 23rd update. But if you want to like get it hands on right now today, you can just go enable this preview and then um, click around in the tool library. Okay, so the next thing, um, next update is enhancements to the work coordinate system probing. So I'm going to go to the probing sections of my toolbar and grab a work coordinate system probe operation. And work coordinate system probing in Fusion does not replace like manual inspection. So if you need to like just locate, like but the very first part I make to find my datum, I do have to do that manually on the machine. Otherwise it doesn't know. Or if you have some kind of setup where like you have a known datum, that's totally fine and you can program based off that. But this doesn't, just to be super clear, this doesn't replace that initial setting of the, like the work coordinate system. It just shifts things later on so that subsequent parts, for example, don't need to necessarily be exactly in the right place. We can shift the work coordinate system by uh, you know, a small amount to compensate for things being a little bit out of place. So for example, if I wanted to like run a bunch of these parts and I didn't wanna have to like manually probe every time, I could just take the finished part out, put a new part in or a new block of stock in within some tolerance, so let's say half an inch, which I think is eyeball, like I could eyeball half an inch, toss it in the vise, clamp it down, run just this work coordinate system probing um, operation from Fusion on the control. And all it's gonna do is find the discrepancy between where it expects and where the part is and just shift everything over. So it's pretty cool stuff. I think there's a couple of videos on YouTube for that. I don't have links, unfortunately, but um, it is really powerful. So what we added is the ability to probe a partial bore or boss. So previously you would have had to have the entire circle um, or like whether it's a hole or a boss feature, you would have had to had had to have the entire circle. And now we can just do this like partial arc. Um, you can grab the arrows and kind of shift them around. You do need to have three to like do the math to figure out where the center of the circle is, which is what it's using to then shift the work coordinate system based on where it expects this arc versus where the actual arc is. Um, and then just some like basics about the probing in general. Oh yeah, we have helpful tool tips for everything. So if you hover your mouse over an input parameter, you get a great tool tip. Usually they explain stuff better than I could with words anyway. Um, but the approach and the over travel are essentially setting like the allowable error. So the approach is how far away it's going to come down and then the over travel is how far past the expected value it'll go. So like if I said within half an inch, which I think I could, I'm medium confident I can eyeball, but I would hope, then I'll set these both to half an inch so that if it's out of position either way in half an inch, I'm not going to break my probe and I'm also going to like let it travel far enough to find the part. The tolerances are like We'll get to these later on, but the tolerances are set here in the geometry tab. And then in the actions tab, I can set an out of position or wrong size message, which basically says if the feature that I'm probing is found to be the wrong size or out of position by that tolerance, then I can stop with a message. So this is really great for like if you're worried about maybe loading the part in super out of position or loading the wrong part in or loading the part in like rotated 90 degrees from what it's supposed to be. 
This will make sure that you verify that the part is in there correctly, in the correct orientation, and then continue on versus throwing the part down, hitting the green button, walking away and coming back to like a bunch of problems. Um, this helps kind of catch that without you physically standing there watching the part get probed. So really good for some like light automation or light just like hands off kind of stuff where you don't need to babysit the control exactly, but you have really good confidence that you're not gonna like, worst case crash your machine, best case like brick tool. Um, and then of course you can print the results. This override driving work coordinate system basically means that by default, this probe operation will be run from the setup work coordinate system, but you could have it be run from a different work coordinate system. So like if I set this to two, the probe will run off G55, but it will update G54. So then if my, the rest of my operations are run off G54, it's gonna shift the work coordinate system, but continue to run the probe off of the previous one. So basically it just keeps the probe from like the work coordinate system that the probe is running from shifting slowly over time, which we call creep. Um, hopefully that makes sense. That can, it's a little, it's a tricky one with the wording, but um, this is a good idea if you are worried about like things shifting a lot over time. The other, oop, I didn't pick tool. And it'll tell you that you need to pick tool. I'm gonna grab that probe. Let me say, okay. The other one that we added was, um, I'll put that at the top. Of course, because I want to run that before I then run all of my subsequent machining operations. Why is it yelling at me? Oh. And I mean, half an inch <laughs> with, a, with a bore this size uh, isn't going to work, so we'll do that, and now we're good. The other thing that we just added is angled faces for, this is basically, if you know where like the center, so if I had probed that bore to shift the work coordinate system, but then there was a possibility that this part was kind of askew in the vise, um, this will help manage that. And it'll like rotate the work coordinate system accordingly to make sure that things aren't askew when we start actually machining. So this uses a G68, which you do need to make sure that your control, like the machine option is enabled. And for Haas, this is a paid option. Um, however, if you have an InSpindle probe, I think you also get this capability is, is my understanding. Um, this won't like magically <laughs> fix things if you just do this alone. You also need to make sure that you know, like you shift appropriately and then and then rotate. I hope that makes sense. There's some pretty good documentation on this by Haas for a little more detail. Um, and this does also need to be G68 needs to be an option in your post, which is in the most recent Haas post on our online post library. And I think we're probably updating other posts as we as we go. We, we tend to do that. We tend to, if something comes in the software, we update the post on the online post library. And then when the software gets updated, all the installed posts will be updated too. Okay, so that is about it on, oh, and then the other thing, since we added that functionality to the work coordinate system probing, it's also available in probe geometry, which is more of an inspection toolpath. So probe geometry or work coordinate system would come first to kind of locate things and, and, and shift the WCS. Probe geometry is gonna be in process to make sure things are the right size, features are in the right position, stuff like that, but the same, the same thing applies where I can now probe this partial and make sure that it's the right size, all that kind of stuff. I can use this to like update the toolware and again, alarm to tell me that like something's wrong if it's out of size or position. All right, cool. Let me know if there's any questions on that. Otherwise I'm gonna jump into turning, which has gotten many, many updates over the last like year or so, maybe a little bit longer. We've been really working on turning so if you're not familiar with our turning operations, they feel very similar to milling. So if I quickly just make a face, grab a tool. They're 
essentially organized into the same kind of tab layout where the first tab is the tool tab. Um, we select geometry. So setting like the front or back and for a facing operation, it just wants to know where the model front is so it can remove all the stock on the front. The, oh, the radii, which is like the heights, but just for a circle. It looks a little more busy, but it's just trying to show you those kind of like concentric circles. The passes tab, which again is going to determine like how we go about removing material and then linking, which determines how the how the tool is moving between those cutting passes. So we've made That's just kind of the overview of turning scene feels pretty familiar. It doesn't feel super foreign to me, at least um, We've made a lot of updates to how those turning toolpaths work and specifically most of the updates have been between profile roughing and profile finishing which used to be combined into one toolpath and now we've broken them out, which does a lot of things in terms of functionality. The big update for this um, month is the addition of even depths of cut. So I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger just so we can all kind of see it better. And I'm gonna check the even depths of cut checkbox. And then just for the sake of demonstration, I'm gonna make another one without even step downs because I think this like, just helps it be the most clear exactly what it's doing. But what this does, and if we look at the front, is it basically looks at the, and this is, this is a gross simplification. Um, there will be a blog that goes like way deeper into the technical details here, but the, the simplified version is basically, it breaks up the diameter geometry into sections. So if we look at the non even step down one, you can see that like here, there's kind of this weird mismatch here. There's a weird mismatch. Um, here, there's a weird mismatch where it's just like not lining up Really at all with like where the the geometry makes pretty significant changes along the way. And if we look at the even step downs one, it does a much better job of finding the diameter steps and what we're calling inflection points where it's curved and basically making like regions. And then with, within each region, it does an even step down that's less than or equal to the maximum allowable step down. So if we open up this um, toolpath again really quickly, I set this maximum depth of cut and it kind of makes it seem like it's like very prescribed, but if you check the even step downs box, it's going to use that as like a maximum limit. And then it'll take the region, divide it up in as close to a step as it can get to the maximum without going over the maximum. So you might take like an extra pass here or there, but it's nice because you're not gonna ever like overload the tool and that maximum step down keeps that from happening. And it's also going to align with your geometry like much better. You're not gonna have these weird areas where you have to like, step up over this lip or something like that. Um, and you're not gonna be, oh, like not necessarily over engaging the tool, but then under engaging it in other places, more, co more consistent tool load, definitely generally speaking a, a better thing. So that's the major update for June. In general, we've also added things like um, when you're setting the geometry limits, so like the front and back, we added a tool limit. Where's my tooltip? This tooltip is pretty good. We're basically, instead of going from like the front of the nose, it's going to calculate based off the contact point. So here, I can't move my mouse or it'll, and I'm pointing at my screen, but I can't move my mouse or it'll go away. But there's one where you can see how it would leave a little cusp behind. And then there's the other where you know it's going to push the actual cutting contact point all the way to the end of that boundary limit. So that one, um, pretty, pretty helpful for when you want to like actually push, you don't have to do any like calculation anymore, set your boundary with an additional offset or anything. It just knows where the contact point is and will push it all the way there. The other major one was um, pecking is like relatively new, I would say. So this adds like a little chip breaking peck every so often where it will stop the tool and even retract it a little. So when you're cutting things that might get stringy or have long chips that can tangle up and stuff and be problematic. This helps with that. And then probably the biggest one is canned cycles. So when I check this box, 
we tried to make it as sort of user friendly as possible by if you check something that makes something else impossible to use. So for example, can cycles and pecking or can cycles and even step downs like don't go together. We tried to in the UI eliminate those options so that they're not like tempting you and sort of uh, reduce the amount of errors where where Fusion then says, I can't do that. So that's why when you check that box, some options will go away in the UI. Um, and what can cycles do is basically, instead of getting kind of the long format code for, for all of these passes, it can sort of truncate it down. So similar to like a drilling can cycle, you're gonna get significantly less code. And this is something that has just been requested for a long time. Um, it's normal for people to want to see can cycles for turning. So it's something that we definitely needed to support and are happy to say we, we do now. Um, anything else for, oh yeah. And then one last one that I think is kind of interesting is for profile finishing. Um, we added this option, allow lead out to cut remaining stock, which is a mouthful. And basically, uh, this one has been pretty requested by people cutting softer materials or um, I think this is pretty commonly used in Swiss too, where basically if I duplicate this again and turn that option off. You'll see, I put that there. so you'll see that it, uh, in my remaining stock here, I have this kind of like very flat wall. And in the finishing operation, it tries to respect that stock by not like, you know, gouging right through it, which some people definitely don't want to happen. So the tool is gonna just go straight up there and avoid a collision. And I get this very helpful warning saying the lead out has been modified due to a gouge with remaining stock. So instead of going at an angle and cutting through everything, it's gonna try to prevent any gouges. That option that I checked, uh, allow lead out to cut remaining stock, basically ignores that warning and then does do this kind of angular lead out and then retract. So again, this is definitely something where like, you don't want to check this box if you're, if you don't want your lead outs to do things like that. But we do have some folks cutting like softer materials where they just want to get the tool out of there and they like this machine motion better. So that is now an option. Um, cool. I think that's all I really had on turning. There's been a lot of like really good, I think Akash, one of our product owners wrote a good blog. I wrote a very long blog on some of the, some of the turning updates over the last year. So I can, I didn't give Nigel links for that either. Sorry, but I can uh, follow up with those later. So lots of good stuff in there. Um, cool. So the next thing is FFF, which is, like I said, plastics additive inside of Fusion. We've had metal additive for a while, but we know that that's not like the most accessible uh, functionality for most people, whereas many, many of our users have like an Ultimaker or a MakerBot or something similar at home or maybe in their shop or maybe just at work to mess around with. So we did want to add support for that. So because this is very new. I'll go through sort of the high level workflow and then specifically what we're releasing in June is a new infill type called gyroid. And I'll, I'll tell you why this one in particular is kind of cool um, when we get there. So the process from the for the setup is essentially the same as milling. Um, you'll come into the setup dialog and then you'll choose additive as the operation type. However, you do have to select a machine for additive. Where for milling, we kind of let you get away with not doing it. You do have to pick one. Um, this will open the machine library dialog and most of the machines are in this Fusion 360 library, which you can then filter by capability. So I'll say additive and then for this one, I'll say FFF and then you can sort of scroll through the list here. And we need you to pick a machine because it comes with all of these like print settings basically baked in. And kind of like you would, uh, kind of like you would set up a post process for milling, you need to tell Fusion like things about your printer. How many nozzles does it have? What kinds of like, what kinds of capabilities can it do? Because that's going to define how your model gets sliced. 
I think that's pretty common for a lot of slicers that are machine agnostic is to like know what machine you're printing on. So this is no different. So I'm gonna grab this Ultimaker and say select. And then right from the get-go, I have the option to come in here and change my print setting. So this will define like the um, type of material I'm printing with, the type of uh, stock, I guess I'm using, the filament, filament I'm using, and the nozzle size. So let's say I'm doing, I think this is what I actually have. So I'll choose that. And there's an option to do automatic arrangement, which will basically just move, if your part's kind of off over here, it'll move it onto the bed for you. Mine's already on the bed, but I'll just keep that checkbox checked anyway. And of course, as always, I have to select the part that I want to slice. So I get this really nice preview of the bed and the build height, um, build volume. And then if I open up the setup, I, have, I can turn that off if I want. Um, and I have the print settings that I'm currently using. And then I haven't yet generated my additive toolpath. But before I get there, I have a couple more steps. So for this part specifically, and this is a real part that I have printed multiple times. <laughs> and it's definitely, I'm not an additive expert. So I didn't design it super great for additive. But I did largely design it to be printed. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I need to revisit this part, but anyway, largely to be printed with, all right, my mouse is being weird, with this side on the bottom. So I can, because I know that, I can quickly use like the move, uh, move components command to select that body and then just like rotate it how I want. If you're not so sure exactly how you want the part position, and I'm gonna do something on purpose to make it angry, but if you're not so sure how you want the part positioned, we also have automatic orientation, which basically looks at various parameters and you can rank them. So like if I want the least support volume, I'll rank that as very high in my uh, desired outcomes. If I don't really care about the support area, I can set it to very low or not used at all. Um, specifically, part height is really important in metals because as the further the part gets from the bed, the more it deforms. So maybe not as important for plastics. I'm not 100% sure, but for metals, this one would be pretty commonly used. And then when you run this, it automatically generates kind of different orientations for the part to be at. And then you can choose from those orientations. So that's definitely a cool feature. A lot of this is coming in from NetFab, so this is all pretty good stuff. Um, NetFab technology tends to be pretty good. So my part looks black. I don't know why it's so black, but it's definitely red. And the red means that something is wrong. So specifically with positioning it, it's like in the build plate. So we have a really helpful kind of automatic option here to place the parts on the platform with a clearance if you want. So I'm gonna click okay. And that just shifts my part up for me which is really nice and it's just directly touching the bed versus using the move and having to kind of eyeball it. Um, I can, under print settings, I can select the pre-configured settings that I sort of showed earlier in that list and then there's also an option to edit them where basically you get, and again, I'm not an additive expert, so some of you probably would know way more about what to come in here and really play with, but I can come in here and make, um, make changes to the, that print settings file. So maybe for like support, I think the Ultimaker 3s have two extruders. I could say I wanna use extruder two if maybe I have like some dissolvable support material in there or even something weaker, or I could just use the same material that I'm gonna be using for the rest of the part. I can make that kind of change here, um, change like the overhang angle that gets support um, generated for it. And then the other G code settings aren't, aren't great, but there's a lot of options in here to like really um, customize what you're doing versus just like using those pre-configured settings. Infill is the, the like star of the June update, I guess. So again, we have a lot of options in here already. And these are largely from NetFab where there's pretty good documentation on what they look like, what their properties are. The new one is Gyroid. And Gyroid is special because it's based off of a naturally occurring 
like structure that's found in butterfly wings and cell membranes. And MIT did a bunch of research on it and found that basically it has an incredibly high strength to weight ratio. And specifically, it is very good at um, shear stress. So like it, it is strong in that way. So really good option if you're trying to print like super lightweight stuff that you need to be strong. And we'll take a look at what it looks like in just a second. So now I feel ready to generate my additive toolpath. I went through kind of like the print settings, the infill. Um, so I'll just right click and say generate, kind of like a milling toolpath, except the milling toolpaths do it automatically, but no big deal. And within you know a minute or two, I'm gonna get my additive toolpath with the supports generated, with the infill generated, all that stuff uh, with the print settings being kept in mind. If I went back and changed one of those things, it would invalidate my currently generated additive toolpath. So I just have to generate again. And the other cool thing we can do is simulate it. So this is, um, I think, pretty common to be able to simulate what your additive toolpath looks like. And we just added, I think in the May release, these colors. So if I drag this up a little bit, the support material is this kind of blue. And I think this geometry, like this, how the support geometry is, is uh, rather automatic. Um, I think it's just kind of a linear shape. I didn't see options to change that, but I'm sure that will be coming in the future. And then you can really see this like gyroid infill in the orange where, uh, yeah, it looks wild. It's apparently very strong, so that's cool. And then the inside and outside perimeters are green and get this kind of brick red color. And then the raft and um, anything on the bed is this kind of purple. So a little more user friendly to look at now versus just like being all the same color. And I can keep, you know, dragging this up. I can also enter a very specific layer height if I want to go look at that. Oops. Didn't like that. Um, Again. Tab and not enter will get you to the current layer height. My bad. Um, so yeah, simulation is pretty nice. It's nice to be able to view exactly what's going to happen, see that infill, all that good stuff. When I'm ready to like get this out, I can export a 3MF, which is a more data rich file format than an STL. And of course, I think like the big, the major value here is that I'm running all of this additive toolpath generation off of like a BRAP model. So if I went and made changes to this design, if I um, really like, which I probably need to do, made some drastic changes and like fix these holes, so they would print better and fix some of this stuff going on that we can't really see that is gonna generate support material I don't want. I would just come back into the additive side the manufacturer workspace and the additive side and just hit regenerate and it would regenerate with the new model geometry with all my print settings intact versus the kind of other workflow that a lot of slicers use where I'd have to re-export an SCL, which is a lossy translation. Um, mesh files are really hard to work with. And I've done this before a million times where I make an edit, I export that file and maybe my naming conventions are bad but then I end up like printing a file that's an old version or not the version that I wanted to because I have like rev a through f in my in my folder of files to print so this is trying to like fix that workflow up a little bit and just because it's fully integrated help you make sure you're printing the correct revision make sure you're exporting the correct revision all that good stuff um, and not have to generate an STL every single time, which can be also kind of a challenge. There is a really good, if you want more, I know this was a high level overview, there is a really good webinar by Tom Stock, one of our process specialists in the Birmingham Tech Center in the UK that I think Nigel also has a link to. So hopefully you can put that in the chat. And he goes it, you know, into a lot more depth. Um, he's a lot more knowledgeable on plastics specifically. So if you're looking for more, definitely check that out. And that is most of the core updates that I want, definitely wanted to get through. So 
I will hop back into the PowerPoint quickly to just talk about the manufacturing extension updates and then any questions, um, I'm ready for those uh, when I get through this. So in the extension, uh, we added four axis rotary, which we've had four axis wrapped toolpaths for a while where basically you could take any 2D toolpath and wrap it around a cylinder but those only worked for geometry that was truly wrapped around a cylinder. So a shape like you're seeing on, on the screen where it's sort of um, changing a lot as it moves around the diameter or on the bottom here, there's like a triangle shape. I don't know if there's a name for that where it's you know definitely not just actually cylindrical. And we didn't really have a solution for that. So four axis rotary um, takes care of that kind of programming need. And you can, so not only can you just like actually machine those now, which is nice, you can also offset the tool for improved cutting conditions. So rather than the tool being pointed directly at the center of rotation, it kind of moves it off to the side. So you're cutting up the ball, which is, um, you know, definitely better for the tool, definitely gives you a better surface finish on the part versus cutting right with the center of a ball end mill. And I think probably my favorite part, especially maybe not having a ton of experience doing four axis milling is that the whole thing feels very user friendly. So there's a lot of graphics. There's um, in the top GIF, I'm setting angular limits where basically I can use selected points off the model to limit to an angular section of the part, which is really nice versus having to like type in exact angles or create a bunch of work planes that might be difficult to generate. I can just pick off the model and it's um, very helpful that way. The next big one was five axis and specifically collision avoidance for steep and shallow, um, where the probably the easiest to use part was just automatically tilting the tool to avoid collisions between the stock, or sorry, the part and the tool and holder. So on this kind of top image, there's like a big complicated mold where it would probably be really difficult to know exactly what all the angles need to be to have that part machine successfully. So Fusion is doing that for me. Um, we did a lot of work on the performance of this. So I think that toolpath for me was calculating in about 15 minutes, um, where that is a toolpath that would, you know, that's a, that's a big complicated toolpath for that part. Um, it is a large mold. So that's, that performance is really encouraging and, and the fact that I'm getting out like a safe toolpath at the end. Um, obviously, it means I can also use shorter tools instead of having to generate a three-axis toolpath with a, you know, very, very long tool. I can now use tilting to get um, a toolpath that's going to work better and give me a better surface finish. There were also options in this release to do to and from point or curve, where basically the tool axis is either going to point towards a point or curve or away from it. And that one's a little confusing to explain with just words, but there is a longer form video on this as well. That's probably worth checking out. Um, and then setting the lead and lean angles, which is what's happening in the bottom GIF, where basically those are relative to the surface normal. So it's a bit difficult as a, as a person, as a human to like look at the surface and know exactly what the normal will be and then set lead and lean angles that are not going to give you any collisions, but in specific cases and in certain, you know, sections of the geometry, this is really helpful for keeping the cut off of the ball of the uh, off 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 of the tip of the ball to get better cut conditions and get smoother machine motion. And then finally, and um, definitely one that I think is really useful for, like we just talked about, or like I just said those toolpaths can take a really long time to generate. So if you find an error or like a teeny tiny section of that toolpath that is bad, um, re like having to go in and fiddle with every individual setting until you get a toolpath that you really like can be super time consuming and take a really long time and be kind of frustrating, I think is the big, for me is the big one. So toolpath modification and in this, case specifically toolpath trimming lets you draw a polygon around kind of problem areas of the toolpath 
and then trim them away. So the nice, like, I think a lot of the value for me personally is in these big complicated toolpaths where you just want to change a little bit. This is a really great way to do that. It doesn't recalculate the whole toolpath. It simply removes the parts that you've drawn the polygon around and you can remove either inside or outside of the polygon. And then it just regenerates the leads. So the, the way the tool is moving between those cutting passes, which is a lot simpler. Um, so the regeneration time or the, you know, the generation time after you've trimmed is uh, speedy, which is really helpful. Um, you can make edits in these polygons too. So they are editable. Uh, if you decide that you want to like adjust it, you drew the first polygon and um, it's not exactly how you wanted it, no big deal. You can go back in and kind of drag the points around. Um, and they are captured in the bottom GIF. It's kind of hard to see, but they are captured in the timeline. So for that specific toolpath, you can see a timeline of all your edits and then you can go back and make changes or just delete and edit if you decide you don't want that edit anymore or um, are just going to rethink the whole toolpath. No big deal. I think, oh yeah. So public preview, like I said, the tool library is currently in public preview like today and will be for the next week until the update. And then the two other things that are in public preview are part alignment and live machine connection to the Haas Classic Control, I believe, via RS-232. So Richard made two really good tutorials for both of these. And again, I apologize that I didn't give Nigel a link, but they are on our YouTube channel. Um, they're really excellent tutorials. He kind of goes through how to use it, why you might use it. For the RS-232 video, he even like makes his own RS-232 connector and like shows you how to set that all up. So if you feel like, you know, enabling those previews and messing around, I highly recommend those two tutorials. And the way to get to these public previews, again, is through your preferences and then in the preview features um, section at the very bottom of that side window. And these, these are extension features. So I think they are currently available outside of the extension, maybe, but they will eventually go in the extension. And if they're not available outside of the ex extension, that's because they will eventually go into the extension. So don't be shocked if that is the case. And I think that is, the end of my kind of scheduled content. So I'm happy to take any questions that might have come through. Yep. And uh, we'll take a look here too. Um, so hopefully I added all of those links. If you haven't seen the links, go ahead and check the Zoom webinar chat. Um, I've added a number of them as well as Brian has added a number of them as we've gone through the presentation here. So if you're looking for all of those links that Marty mentioned, um, some of them are in the chat for those of you who are looking there. Um, in regards to questions, I covered some in the back um, in terms of like how to get to part one of this session we did last week. Um, if you want to find any of our videos or any of the past webinars, they're all recorded, um, including this one, which is being recorded right now. So hello, future me. And um, they're going to be up on our YouTube channel at some point in the next week or so. So if you missed last week's and you want to go ahead and catch up on some of the modeling stuff in Fusion 360, go ahead and take a look at our YouTube channel. That's going to be youtube.com slash technologies. If you want more Fusion stuff, the Autodesk Fusion channel um, also has tons, and I mean tons of videos. So if you want to hear um, some of our friends at Autodesk voices more often, go ahead and take a look there, and uh, those will be there as well. Brian, did you see any questions in the back? Uh, I do not, um, but I, I do want to mention that our productivity training that we have on a monthly basis, our next one is going to be on generative design for Fusion 360. It's going to be next Wednesday at 8.30 a.m. Pacific time. So if you guys like uh, to see more of Fusion 360 in action and more of its capabilities, of, of its many capabilities, I would definitely recommend uh, signing up for that. And let me go ahead and copy and paste the link to sign up for, for our productivity cool. training. We'll let you go ahead and do that, Brian. Um, I know there were other questions that I saw from the other channels um, in regards to how to get Fusion 360 if you have like Inventor already. Um, and so it's a pretty simple question to answer. Uh, if you have Inventor already, odds are you probably have the uh, product design and manufacturing collection or something similar. Um, the product design and manufacturing collection also includes Fusion 360. So all of the stuff that you guys saw today 
um, you have access to at least um, once June 23rd hits and all of that stuff goes live. Cool. And then in regards to getting updates for Fusion, it's a question, are they, are they automatic or do you have to download something? Um, that's a question I get pretty often. So Marty, did you want to go ahead and field that one for us? Yeah. So unfortunately, I don't have an update currently, but if you are using Fusion and there is an update, it just gets pushed right to you. So this little kind of clock icon in the, uh, in the upper corner here will have a one next to it when it's time to update. You'll click here and then it will say, Fusion 360 is uh, ready to update and there'll be a button, like a link to relaunch Fusion and that will get you the update. Um, if for some reason you don't want to update yet, you can just ignore that <laughs> message and it, you'll stay in your current version. Um, but yeah, they just come right to you, which is great. So there's no nothing you have to hunt down, no kind of like install or anything like that. Yeah, no downloads, none of that account portal stuff. So yeah. um, it, it's very simple. I really like the, the manner in which they are installed um, within Fusion 360. I know that uh, I get lost in the sauce because I have 15 Autodesk applications installed on my computer and making sure they're all updated is sometimes a bit of a chore. Um, and Fusion 360 is just one of the ones I don't have to worry about. So I really like it in that sense. Um, let's see here. I think that's it for questions that we got today. Um, if you do have any more, um, or any questions unrelated to this, feel free to shoot me an email. I send you emails every week with the reminders on them. So feel free to reply with that, or reply to one of those, even if it's unrelated. I'll go ahead and address that for you as well. Um, again, I'd just like to thank Brian and Marty for joining us this morning and, and helping us put all of this together. I think it's really important that we, uh, we get this information out to the people and uh, you guys did that excellently. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So thanks again, everybody for joining us. Um, we'll see you again next week at 10 a.m. Pacific. Uh, for more AVAs. So again, everybody, thanks, and we'll see you soon. Talk to you later. Take care, guys.